and welcome to episode 76 of Popcorn and Prosecco, a show that's all about talking about movies. I am Perry Nemroff, and here are my co-hosts, Christy Puchko and Angie Hahn. Hello! Hey! All right, so we've got two new releases to talk about this week. First up, we're going to do a mini review of Vacation, and then we're going to finish up with a full review of Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. So I am beginning with Vacation. Here is the synopsis from IMDb. Rusty Griswold takes his own family on a road trip to Wally World in order to spice things up with his wife and reconnect with his sons. You know, that's funny because that's actually one of the best descriptions that I've read about the movie because most people have just been pitching it as, like, the new vacation. Yeah. But I kind of like that at least that points out the fact that they made it important that he had issues with his wife, even though the way that they did it in the movie is, like, the worst thing ever. And I do wish they took it out, but I, I at least like that some preview mentioned it. Yeah, that's the thing. It's funny because reading that, I'm like, that is what the movie's about. Huh. And I feel that's... like if that synopsis had gotten out there earlier, people would have been like, what? Like, cause, I mean, that's not what it's, it's about. It's weird because I just... I don't care about the Griswolds at all. I, I Watching this movie, I was like, nah. I, it's not even like I think they're bad people. I just didn't care. I thought they were the least interesting people in this entire movie. And, like, I didn't realize that until it gets to the section where you meet his in-laws, where you meet um, Chris Hemsworth as Stone, who is, like, a local weatherman slash cowboy slash tea party guy. And, um, yeah, I, like, then I started laughing, and then I was like, oh, right, I find the Griswolds really boring as people. See, I couldn't even enjoy that part of it because I found all the other jokes so either unfunny, mean-spirited, and, like, you guys know that a lot, like, anything will roll off me. Like, nothing bothers me in the world. But I found a lot of the jokes really offensive, too. But worst of all, I found a lot of them, like, flat-out nauseating. Like, I... You know at the beginning, so in our screening, they they started the movie with no sound, so we saw the credits, which, I mean, spoiler if you care about the opening credits, but it's like, they'll show, they'll show it's trap. It's awkward family photos. They're and they awkward would, like, family show photos, but they would then reveal the funny thing that makes them awkward. And some of them was like, you know, someone puking, like snot coming out of a kid's nose, and because they played the movie with no sound, we had to watch it twice, and I'm you sure you're taking the text of this. I, put my, I had to put my head down, and it was almost the same thing when they were sitting in that stupid... Uh, what they hot thought spring. was the hot spring. So I was totally nauseated by that. But comparing it to the original Vacations, I was never a big fan of those Vacation movies whatsoever. I was just never that into it. And I never found them funny. It's not my kind of humor. The only thing that kept me engaged in those movies, though, was the fact that it always honored that it was about a family who loved each other coming together and spending time together. Yeah. That's not really what this movie is about, and it's not really even where it goes in the end. I also think that Chevy Chase's energy is a lot different than Ed Helms's, where Chevy Chase was kind of a dick in those movies, so, like, you kind of got to enjoy relating to him but also judging him a little bit, and it was this kind of complicated relationship that I think worked for that humor. In this, even though Ed Helms, we've seen him play the angry guy in The Office and stuff, in this, he's just a dope. And, like, a dope to the point where I actually started disliking him because he would just say stuff and do stuff that you're like, what is wrong with you? Like, how are you a functioning human being? Yeah, that's that's interesting that you put it that way. Maybe that's why I was a little more tolerant of the humor in the original ones because it was like Chevy Chase's character was, was a dope in a way. He made stupid decisions, but he was doing so because he was also a dick and he was making those decisions because he was a jerk. Yeah. Whereas here, it's like him trying to be goofy and lovable and just making stupid decisions, and that He's not kind of doesn't really fly. The only parts of this movie that I really enjoyed were the cameos. I liked the bit with Charlie Day. I just thought that that was, you know, super visual and really well edited. So yeah. that, that was funny for that reason. And I enjoyed for, like, the hot second that it was funny and original, the part with Michael Pena and the other yeah, three which actually, cops. when Michael Pena showed up, our audience applauded, which I yeah. feel like is, one, something to how Michael Pena has had a huge impact post-Iron Man, and, two, how little this movie has going on for it that Michael Pena being on screen for, like, maybe three minutes was a highlight. Like, yeah. Way. They could have done so. I would, you know, I would have liked to have seen a whole feature film about those four cops. Actually, that is a great freaking idea. A comedy about the four cops, the four cops who are responsible Four Corners for the, for the Monument. The of the Four Corners. That'd be great. I would have loved See, that. See, that's actually, I wrote in my review, it hit a point where I realized I'd rather be watching a movie about literally any other character yeah. in that movie. No, I'm with you. So, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that we are not recommending it. And I'm actually going to go as far to say that this is the one, one of the worst movies I've seen all year, and I think you should just avoid it. 
Wow. I would say avoid it just because it's not that funny. And I mean, like, you know, I'm getting a lot of comments on my review that are like, humor subjective. Like, all reviews are subjective. If you think the vacation movies are all typically funny, then maybe you'll like this. I liked Christmas Vacation growing up. I haven't really watched it in years, but I just thought this was funny and it wasn't funny. And less offensive, more just lazy. Like, the jokes they make are just... We've been there. Who cares? Very repetitive, too. They don't let anything go throughout the entire movie. Yeah. Saying a boy has a vagina. Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> All right. On to our next movie, which has nothing to do with any of that. So there's no transition. Vagina, vagina segue. Yeah, really. We're going to talk about Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation, and Angie, you're going to take that one. All right. Here is the synopsis for Mission, Impo Mission colon, Impossible dash Rogue Nation. Uh, Ethan and team take on their most impossible mission yet, eradicating the Syndicate, an international rogue organization as highly skilled as they are, committed to destroying the IMF. Oh, is that the plot of the movie? I had no fucking idea. That's because... actually funny because Angie and I were discussing yesterday, like, what does the Syndicate no. want? Yeah, like, no, I, this is... I, I, no shade, because I don't really give a shit about the plots of the Mission Impossible movies. I am actually hard-pressed to remember any of them. Oh, well, um, that's what but I was yeah, about like, to say. To like, and I was like... I don't, I mean, I know they're bad they, guys. They just want to, I thought that they just wanted to topple, they wanted to topple, like, the IMF and just, you know, organize, know like, protective forces. All you really the need IMF to know gets in evolved the vague in terms. All you really need to know is, like, in the vaguest terms, the IMF is good, we're rooting for them, the syndicate is bad, we're rooting against them. The syndicate is Hydra, move on. Like a sports yeah, rivalry, um, and you're just like, sure. Like, I have no idea what would have happened if the syndicate had won. I'm sorry, spoiler alert, but, like, really, you already know yeah, what this you is. Know <laughs> but, yeah, um, it's funny because, so, like, but like, like, the thing is, it's a, mission impossible, it's a Mission Impossible movie, so really the only point of the plot is, like, to have an excuse to get from, like, one awesome scene to another and on that front like sure it's good enough a after a while I lost track of what was going on but I didn't really care uh, this one has some really great action I mean that's kind of like the whole point of the Mission Impossible movies and it's if it weren't for Mad Max Fury Road which just I'm sorry it broke the curve for movies this summer like I would be like oh my god this has like the best action of the year and such like the plane stunt that they keep selling in the marketing isn't even the best one. There's like three or four that are actually that better than that. That made me so happy because the first thing is like the first thing they do is the plane stunt. It's literally like five minutes into the movie. How, and but how just... fantastic is that though? Because otherwise like a scene like that should be the end of a movie but if that scene didn't come up right in the beginning the entire movie we would have been sitting there being like exactly, oh, and that's when's it coming? That's actually what's really smart about this and why I think it's so much fun is that they tease this thing to you that is bonkers and so crazy to watch. And it's the first thing you see Ethan Hunt do. Literally, they're like, where's Ethan? I don't know. I don't know. And then he springs out of nowhere, jumps on a fucking plane, and that's how the movie starts. And then they just cut to credits because you're like, all right. And it's like it never, it never like slows down. It's always at that level of like, all right. And my favorite thing about this movie is that while – it's it's hard to make a decision on Tom Cruise as a person with all scandal and Scientology and whatever. Like watching these movies, when you watch his his face when he goes from like yeah gonna do this and then literally leaps into action again and again, it's so fun. It's so exciting and you like. I was actually yelping in my screening because stuff would happen that I was just like, oh my god, that happened. Yeah, and there was like one scene yeah. in the middle. Um, I think you might have seen it. This was advertised a little bit too, but the underwater one, like, it's it comes in the middle of the movie. You know there's no danger of, like, Ethan Hunt dying, okay? But I was just like, like, I was in the theater, like, gasping for air. Like, it's shot really well. Uh, and All he, of it and, like, shot just, well. and really even, beautifully. Like, what? And how about that that opera scene too? Because that that's opera scene that's, <laughs> that's one that really benefits from being shot and really well. And another climax. I want to point any, out that we've already discussed three different set pieces that have nothing to do with the end of the movie. They're all in like the first half of the movie, like all the stuff we just talked about. We yeah. should actually make sure we leave rooms for spoilers so we can discuss that climax, which is I loved it. But I, I'll, I I'll leave it at that it. until we get towards the end of this. But that opera scene always amazes me because I, I got to see it twice because it was so weird, too. And didn't you get to watch it in the so, opera house itself? So I went to the, the world premiere in Vienna, and the first the first night we were there, they did, like, a standards critic screening, which we just went, like, to the local theater and we watched it. But then the next night after we did the red carpet, we were allowed to see it for the premiere. So we watched the opera scene, like, sitting in the opera house. And it was it was weird. There's one shot where you can kind of see the stage from the perspective we were viewing the screen. So it almost looked like it was, like, an extension of the movie. Wow. But it, 
But really, I mean, sitting in that room and watching that happen and looking around to various spots of the Opera House where all of those people are, it, like, makes it even more mind-blowing that Christopher McQuarrie nailed the uh, the geography of all that really well because it's pretty freaking incredible that you know who's aiming at who because it's all different, who's mm -hmm. chasing who, what, like, switch affects, like, another prop somewhere. I mean... Yeah. Like, those things pull together in a way that is very difficult to achieve, and they do a beautiful job with it. Um... I think we all agree the action scenes are amazing, but let's let's talk about like Tom Cruise is the best. He's still really great in these. Yeah. But guys, Rebecca fucking Ferguson. Like, yeah, she's like someone. I don't think that many people knew who she was. Apparently, she was on a show called The White Queen, which I guess some people have seen. Apparently, she was Hercules, Hercules, which I watched last week and have zero memory of already. Yeah. She seemed to have come out of nowhere, and she nails it. Like, are you sure you watched actually, The Right Hercules? I did. I double checked. Okay. Just Watch making sure movie, but that movie left zero impression on my brain. Well, not only is she not only is she great, but the movie actually really like plays her up. Like you know, the Mission Impossible movies are always they're about Ethan and then co-stars. You know, yeah. um, this is like one of the like she actually comes pretty close to being a co-lead, which is impressive considering how much these are still Tom Cruise vehicles. And for like a, there's like a long stretch in like maybe about like a third of the a third of the way through the movie where she actually feels like the lead kind mm -hmm. of in the way that like Furiosa was secretly the lead of like Mad Max Fury Road like she's the one that's like driving the action they also give her a lot like she gets she gets a lot of character development mm -hmm. um so you know praise I, I have so much praise for Rebecca Ferguson for like her charisma and like the way she sells this character but I also want to point out that it's it's not just her like the writers and the director did a great yeah. job of yeah. building this and really I was reading the press notes and they referred to her as the female Ethan Hunt. I didn't get that really. Oh, you know what's funny is that I I did get that. Like I felt like they were so because like obviously all the other movies, you know, everyone's talented and skilled and can fight their way out of incredible situations, but it's always Ethan who's indestructible. And yeah. here I felt like she was right up there with him in terms of like her fighting capabilities. And well, I really did genuinely believe that he needed her help in some instances. Christy, you brought it up before with his faces. There's some faces that he makes before they do the underwater thing where it's like even even though he'll do anything to save the day, like his face contorts in a way that I really believe that he was afraid to do that. Yeah, and what's cool about her is that I actually said in my review for Spinoff that I think she kind of runs circles around Cruz in this, and that's not a dig at him. That's just like, he's amazing, and just when you think that that series can't get any crazier, she's like, what? Like, I mean, part of it is that it's the element of and surprise. They don't. Well, like, what's interesting to me is that, like, Tom Cruise, they always try to play down how t small he is and make him seem, you know, like, big and masculine. But Rebecca Ferguson comes off as flat-out petite. They keep actually having her remove her heels in this movie, which I love for multiple Jurassic Park or yeah. Jurassic World yeah. reasons, but also just because it makes sense. But, like, she removes her heels, she's barefoot, and she's just like, let's do this. And it's like, repeatedly, she wraps her legs around men, crawls up them like some sort of incredible Amazon, and then just, like, uh, devastates their faces and heads, and you're just like, what just happened? Like, oh, I want to talk about that a little bit, because uh, one of the things that I liked about her and the, and the way this character is portrayed is that they give her a really convincing physicality, because I think we've all seen those action movies where, like, some, like, you know, 5-foot, 80-pound waif is, like, kicking the well, shit out of a giant man, and you're, it's it's not, it, and they do it the, in a way that's not believable. Yeah. Even though you point out that she's small, she seems, like, really strong in the way that her fight scenes are choreographed. Like, she seems powerful. Like, you well, this, actually believe she could take down these people. This movie definitely definitely does good things with the uh, with the female lead more so than any other Mission Impossible movie. Yeah. But, but I will say that is true of all Mission Impossible movies. I feel like the female agent always does seem very capable to me, at least. Yeah, they I don't seem think very they, capable, ever got any, also, they never they got seem... any character development, but I in all the fight scenes, like, like uh, who is it? Maggie Q and Paula Patton? Is she? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm not the, I like, think the two of them totally kicked ass. No, totally. I would have liked to have seen more of them. I'm not, saying, I'm not It's not to downplay how good those women were. I'm just saying that in, for this movie, like I thought that they did a really good job of like. She gets a much her... greater focus. Like Paula Patton basically got this lame arc of like trying to avenge her old boyfriend. Where like, oh, Rebecca that that really oh but she really gets like a killer ending. Yeah, well, when Rebecca throw, when she throws what's her face out the building. Movie, uh, arc out of this, but what what I'm worried about is that that the Mission Impossible movies have a tendency to be like, and here's a girl that you're never going to see again. Well, I don't I don't think they're going to do that based on the reaction she's getting from Right? Like, I don't I think they would dare. I would be furious if the next one doesn't involve her because I don't she's think such that's an interesting character. 
I, I mean, I feel like other than Tom Cruise and Ving Rhames, there's no characters, and maybe at this point, Simon Pegg, there aren't that many characters that are non-negotiable, but they do kind of try to bring back characters. Oh, or I think Simon Pegg definitely is. Simon Pegg definitely deserves Yeah, Simon I'm Pegg definitely no, I just, deserves yeah, I'm back, saying, yeah. like, you know, I think that, I think, though, like, I don't think they necessarily wrote him being, like, originally wrote the character being, like, he's going to be in every Mission Impossible movie from now on, but I feel like if, if since the reaction to her is so good, and people want to see her come back, I, I feel like she will. And what and I how, how, how good, though, was Simon Pegg in this movie? He oh, had two, he's lovely. He had, but he had two scenes in particular where it wasn't just like, you're playing this role in an action movie. I'm like, you're a really fucking good actor, and that's why this scene is either so funny and or tense. What were the what scenes? It was the it was that scene in the beginning when he's doing the lie detector test with Alec Baldwin, and then the 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 ending, which is why I think that ending is so different, but it works so well. Yeah, he's we going to we'll get to the sack. We'll get to the sack that in a sec. But I do want to say another thing I find really interesting in this, which gives me hope that maybe they'll bring Rebecca back in a more important role, because they don't even mention Paula Patton's character in this movie. Like no one even knows she exists anymore. It's just like mm, whatever. Um, but Jeremy Renner in Go to Call seemed to have been set up to, if and when Tom Cruise ever retires from this, he would take on the helm. And then in this, all he gets to do really is like bicker with Alec Baldwin, and he doesn't really get any action scenes. And regrettably, to my point, he doesn't get to strange and show off his butt. But Rebecca Ferguson gets all those scenes, and she gets to do all this really exciting stuff. So what I'm hoping for is that for the next, whatever the next Mission Impossible is, they can find a reason to bring her character back because. She's fucking rad. Like, the character has a great setup. Her scene time with, with Ethan Hawke is really interesting. And though I think there's a scene that where they go into, like, a romantic zone that I feel like the rest of the movie doesn't justify... I don't it, think that it's romantic at all. But okay. A lot of people yeah, are arguing with me about that. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad... I would prefer it not be that, but there's, like, one scene where she's like, run away with me. And it just feels like that moment where the, where the girl is like, forget your responsibilities I, and heroism I disagree and come with away you. with me. Well, but I, I think, disagree I think with your reading they... of that scene, but I don't want to spend, like, another five minutes well, just, so just to point out, I, I think that they actually respected that kind of moment really well, because this is the whole thing about how the governments don't appreciate him, and, like, why is he even doing this, doing so all this kind of work? So it's supposed to be a work. twist on that scene, is what so you're saying? So it, it's to be like, you, you know, yeah, a little bit, and, like, we can run away from it all for that reason, not so we could live happily ever after okay. together. Okay, I like that reading better than what I got from it. I'm hoping you're right. I, maybe I'd have to watch it again. But, um, yeah, anyway. basically, I think we should move into spoilers. Spoilers. But, but, if you don't want to hear spoilers, I think we're and, saying that this movie's fucking bonkers and Rebecca yeah. Ferguson deserves all the things. Okay, I want yes. to talk about the end of the movie. So I'm going to flat out say what happens in the end of the movie. Okay, so one of my favorite things about this plane scene being at the beginning is that not only is the big thing everyone's been advertising and obsessing over in the beginning and over and done with so early on, but instead of trying to top it with like an even crazier stunt in the end, instead we get like kind of like a one-on-one -on -one fight with words almost and tension and just, it's it's three people sitting at a table with other with other players around them for it various ends reasons like a... but it's so low key and so tense oh my god I, I was so caught off guard and so surprised and loved it yeah it ends like almost, almost like a the ending almost has like more of like a thriller or a noir sure, yeah. feel than like yeah. a big action adventure feel which was very unexpected I mean one thing I'll say about this movie it keeps surprising me I keep being like oh okay and I, there was a lot of negative talk about that ending too do you remember when there was like those news rumors where they had to reshoot the ending there was a yeah, lot of, there yeah. was a lot of talk mm -hmm. about that and based on the conversation I had with the cast and, and Macquarie and conversations other people had with them a lot of work was done on the script throughout and then especially on the ending where they reworked everything while they were shooting. And you just look at that and, that like, how, how can we judge now when there's reshoots or, like, you rethink things? It's just so well done. Well, here's, here's what makes me curious. I'm wondering now if maybe they got back the footage and they were like, oh, Rebecca's killing it. We need to make sure we can bring her back. Like, I'm wondering if that's part of it. I think it could been could have been for a lot of different reasons. It could have been for what I because I I know he he wavered back and forth on what to do with the syndicate and if he even wanted to make the syndicate the big bad in the end of the movie. And I think a lot of it also had to do with whether like how people would look at Ethan if he killed Sean Harris's character. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of that going back and forth might have also affected well, it. I want to point out one thing I have a problem with with Sean Harris his character. He looks Wayne, so much like Simon Wayne. Pegg. It is distracting to me. <laughs> really. I thought, I like, oh okay, so I thought in the first scene, I was like, that looks like Simon Pegg, weird, and then they made him a big character, and I was like, this is really strange, and then Ethan draws the picture of him, and I'm like, you, that is a sketch of Simon Pegg, like, what are you doing? Oh, maybe, I guess maybe it's the glasses. 
I think, I think there's I one scene where they're literally of a... nose to nose, and I'm like, oh, you look like his, like, fraternal's twin. I'm gonna go on Google kind of their like faces similar and put bone structure. Together. And then they put them both in glasses and with, like, not very different hair. Oh. And I feel like that's what it was. Or Chrissy's just racist. We don't I, Yeah, I'm that, racist That, that didn't even cross my Irish mind until you English brought it up. But now I that you true. said it, I did ask on Twitter, and several people said that they had the same response, where they felt, oh. like, crazy. Like, Kate Urbland and Ed Douglas were both like, I felt crazy watching that, because I was like, They're, are they supposed to look alike? Are they brothers? What is happening? Um, but it's a very minor thing. It has nothing to do with the guy's performance. It's just the way they styled him, especially. I was like, you guys look so much alike, I find it confusing. Um, All right, so we, we should wrap this up. But, like, as we said before, oh. we... I want to say one more thing. Also, if you're a fan of the Into, Into the Loop in the series that preceded it, there's a really fun casting bit in this movie that made me so happy I literally went, Oh! <sighs> Apparently you had a lot of very I did. I was outburst with the yeah, my, my Why, why am I not surprised? Um, so clearly we all dig the movie and think you should go see it. What do you guys think of another Mission Impossible movie? Does this make you want another yes. one? Yes. Okay. Yes. A thousand times yes. Yes. Yeah. And it makes me want a spin-off where Rebecca Ferguson actually gets to be the lead. Hmm. Yeah. Not a bad idea. All right. So clearly we are all very high on Mission Impossible. So go see that and not vacation this week. That is a wrap on episode 76 of Popcorn and Prosecco. As always, you can find us on iTunes where we would like you to subscribe to us. And you can also rate and leave some comments there. We also have our website, popcornprosecco.com. We have our YouTube channel. And we have our Twitter account, at Popcorn Prosecco. Please like us on Facebook as well. And then we are all over the Internet. Christy, you want to go first? Sure. You can find me at Christy Puchko on Twitter. That's K-R-I-S-T-Y-P-U-C-H-K-O. And I write all over the internet. You can find a lot of my reviews on Spinoff right this week. And uh, But you can find the highlights at DecadentCriminals.com. Angie? You can find me on Twitter at A-J-H-A-N. And you can find my writing at SlashFilm.com, including my Mission Impossible Rogue Nation review. And you can catch me on Twitter at P. Nemroff and my writing and all of my Mission Impossible Road Nation Vienna premiere coverage is on Collider.com. So thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you next week. Bye.